Hello and welcome. Well, as many states and territories begin testing and staggering back to school in various different forms, this doesn't yet mean that life is back to normal. And uh, for many parents, this unfortunately <laughs> means that distant and home learning is not off our radars or just yet. And we all know how much everyone's been loving the experience of homeschooling so far. <laughs> so this means, I guess, the pressure is still on for parents to keep their children engaged and motivated and learning um, whilst they still um, are facilitating remote learning outside the classroom. So to discuss this today, we welcome Jason Kimberley, CEO of Cool Australia, about the, uh, the challenges um, parents face as they attempt to continue to inspire and motivate kids to learn from home. Now, a little bit of, about our guest. Now, Jason Kimberley is a father of three children aged between 10 and 15 years. Now, he launched Cool Australia in August 2008 um, to make education interesting, practical, meaningful and engaging. And today, Cool Australia real world educational content in, is used in 90% in of Australian schools and has a growing footprint across New Zealand. Thank you so much for your time. We know you're a busy man. How are you doing? Great, Rachel. Thank you for having me on. It's great to be with Kidopedia today. Wonderful. Lots to talk about. So let's get stuck straight into it. Um, now, for a while now, I guess home um, for many hasn't been the place where the family comes back to each day to retreat and relax. It really um, has become a place of protection, if anything, almost like a fortress, if you like. Um, and it's also been a classroom, it's been an office, it's been a playground and everything in between. So I'd love to know, um, just at, at, at the get-go, you know, how do you think parents can continue to support their kids in this unusual living environment that we're all experiencing at the moment? Yeah, look, Rachel, I think a lot of it's about uh, learning as we go. And I think it's very important to, to learn from our mistakes and what doesn't work so well. So uh, I know from my, my experience that I what I was doing eight weeks ago, I'm certainly not doing uh, this week or last week. So it's really a great opportunity to understand how your children learn and to really work with them. Uh, some of the mistakes that parents make is trying to be a teacher. We're yes. not trained don't try and be teachers. Um, and really, when you get stressed, your kids get stressed. So um, if things aren't being completed on time, or if things aren't working out, or you know, you've know you been shown up to not how to do grade five maths, which I just was this <laughs> afternoon, um, it's not a thing to worry about. It's a thing to uh, enjoy. And I think the ability to uh, embrace this moment, I mean, who knows if we're ever gonna get another time again to sit at home with our children for a couple of months and get really deeply engaged in their learning. Um, to me, that's a real silver lining. I know it's frustrating at times, and I know it mightn't be our first choice, but when we sit down and take a deep breath and have a think about what's going on in our lives, I just think it's a wonderful opportunity. And um, what it does take is um, lots of understanding and lots of patience. And uh, again, all these learnings about ourselves and about our children, about how we all cope with these different things. I think it's been a, a wonderful life experience for, uh, for all of um, uh, our, our, our kids and also for us. And I know it's um, been a tough time for people who aren't able to get to work and, um, you know, and that's uh, really challenging. But also on the other side, you know, I think there's um, lots to be learnt from the slow down pace of life and not dashing around everywhere. You know, all those kids after school activities and the chess <laughs> club and the running club and the whatever club it is, all these different things. And uh, to me, it's been that opportunity to sit down and just take a bit more of a relaxed approach to things. And um, um, when you look at all the uh, the research about what does this mean, not being at school for, uh, for eight weeks and having the at-home learning, well, the data um, around this, Professor John Hattie from uh, um, Melbourne University, he's um, Australia's sort of leading expert on these things. And Australia um, actually do 10 weeks less education than uh, many of the leading countries who are ahead of us in the PISA international rankings. So um, by having eight weeks at home, there will be some drop off in secondary maths, some kids might get behind. But apart from that, the data suggests that there's no real impact. So I know lots of people are concerned about that, but um, I'm a bit old fashioned. I like to follow the data and the data says that it's really only some kids in secondary maths that are gonna have a bit of an issue. Everyone else can pick it up. And it's not like we're losing the time in isolation, the whole country, the whole world has lost the time. So relatively speaking, we haven't gone backwards. We've just um, slowed down a little bit and done it a different way. What a great perspective that is. 
and it's just a glass half full, you know, lens on everything. So thank you for sharing that. And that's, it's, it's really refreshing to hear. So thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, you know, it's really been said that one of the, um, the biggest challenges I think that parents are facing is at the moment is just keeping the kids motivated. Um, so I'd love to know from your perspective, why do you think this is so? And what advice do you have uh, for parents that actually could help? Well, I, I think the idea of motivation, the problem with motivation is I think there's an unrealistic, expect, unrealistic expectation for kids to be motivated the whole time. And yeah. guess what? They're not. Parents mm -hmm. aren't, kids aren't, no one is. So to expect a kid to sit down at 8.30 and smash out a full day of lessons till 3.30 <laughs> and that's it, is totally unrealistic and you're setting yourself up for, for failure. Um, but it's not really a failure at all. I think you just really applied the wrong principle. So I'm a big fan of, um, uh, you know, of creating the, the right work environment for the, uh, for the individual and giving them what's achievable. If your kid gets halfway through a lesson and has a, uh, a throwdown or loses concentration, needs so you know what? Let them do something else. There's nothing wrong with sitting down and, and having a read. And even the planning of the day can be really important. So, you know, you don't want to be giving kids, um, uh, introduce them to new maths problems at two o'clock in the afternoon after lunch. But I can tell you right now, nothing is going to be absorbed. Things yes. like uh, uh, maths and uh, maybe some tricky English or grammar sort of concepts. Do those things in the morning when your kids are fresh and their brains are alert and ready to go. And then in the afternoon, maybe after lunch, when things are a bit more relaxed, you know, use the other side of the brain. That's when we can do the PE, we can do the art, we can do the creativity. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, defaulting to those things. So I think flexibility is very important. Don't get, have, have a routine that you plan, but don't rigidly enforce it. If something's not working, change it you know i say to my kids that uh, if they're trying something repeatedly trying to do the same thing over and over again i say mr albert einstein would have something to say about your approach here. <laughs> so one um, if something's not working change your approach keep changing keep trying different things yeah. look at your shit of the day some kids get really uh, it, it's a simple thing like put the kids school uniform on really helps some kids focus they're in that mindset of i'm learning i'm not at home mucking around with mum and dad and my brothers and sisters i've got my I'm uniform on i'm ready to learn. so you know there's just lots of little things that you can do like that so keep them motivated don't expect 100 percent motivation all the time i think you don't want to be motivated when you need to focused when you need to but to expect a whole day of um motivation is uh you're headed for trouble Yes, un a little bit unrealistic. Um, yeah. You've just mentioned before about scheduling, and I guess now um, I'd love to sort of just speak about this for a moment, but as, you know, as many students, I guess, are going to start to embark on staggered return to the classrooms in, in various different states and ter territories, um, mm -hmm. I guess we are slowly going to undo some of the good work that we've been doing with setting schedules and structure, um, which we've been told time and time again from experts that that's what we should be doing and, and have to be... Yeah you know, providing the children. Um, but this, um, this, I guess this staggered approach and, and the backward and forwarding from homeschooling and the home environment back into the classroom may make the children start to feel a little bit unstuck. So I'd love to know from your perspective, what are your thoughts on this and how it could uh, like potentially just impact their, you know, them and their, their education? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of emphasising the positives. So, uh, you know, kids do love routine, but they also love, you know, within that routine, if things are changing, they like to know what's going to be happening. So I'm certainly speaking to, to my kids and you know, to others about um, talking to kids about, okay, what are the great things about going back to school? And we've had these conversations, you know, seeing my friends again playing sport again, um, you know, doing the uh, after school homework club or whatever it might be, all your child's interest is, I think it's important to focus on them. And as adults, I mean, we, we um, sometimes forget how intuitive and smart and switched on kids are. So yeah. if we've got a positive approach to our kids return to school, hey, guess what? Our kids are going to have a positive approach too. So our parents Love are mumbling that. over the table saying oh i can't believe it's only one day why aren't they going back all the time you know the government wouldn't know what they're doing this should have happened weeks ago or why is it happening so quickly you know it's all great to have these conversations but if you want to have a positive frame of mind on your children 
you need to have a positive attitude yourself and that needs to be reflected in your conversations with your children. So again, you know, focus on the, what the great things will be like for junior school. You can go back to the library. Uh, you know, some kids are that you can play, you know, the, your ball games again or whatever it might be. So uh, accentuate the positives. And also, you know, I think we can talk about some of the things at home that mightn't have worked so well and say, oh, we won't have to do this anymore. And everyone can have that knowing smile of, uh, yeah, we don't have to do that anymore. All squeezed around the kitchen table trying to do our our maths work so um you know i am a, a big advocate of uh, you know looking for the positives explaining away you know any negatives get the kids to um ask questions ask questions of them how you're going to cope what's the bus table like how the drop-off's going to go and i think it's important to explain things will be different you know parents probably will not be allowed to go into the schools to take their kids and walk them into the classroom and give them a kiss goodbye for the littler kids i mean that's a reality so um you know parents i need to start having these conversations saying things are going back to how they were but they won't quite be the same, same. and we all need to keep an eye out and you could even write you know an idea with kids you know they love recording write a diary what are the different things about school let's talk about all the things that are different now that you're back what are the things what's better what's not so good what are the positive things about mum not walking you in you're growing in your own independence you can take yourself to classroom now because you're a big girl or a big boy so all these different things i think it's really important to find out reasons why it's actually a good thing and not a negative and to have those conversations in advance with your children yeah. and again they're a lot smarter and a lot more intuitive than than uh, we give them credit for sometimes and i hope parents have really learned that lesson in the last two months yeah so i'm just hearing really open conversation open honest conversations with your kids is that what you're saying yeah open honest conversation who knew <laughs> <laughs> Right, we need more of it. I mean, maybe we can even look at our federal government. We're, we've, we've had a collegiate response with our government, our state and our federal governments working, here, working together across parties. We've, guess what? We've, we've got experts to tell us what to do. We're following what experts are telling us what to do. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's great, but it's also odd that we had to get to this before we had to listen to experts to tell us what we uh, need to be doing in our world. But that's Which another conversation. What should be instinctive. Um, <laughs> now, we've published your article titled The Top Five Problems Encountered by Parents and How to Combat how to combat them so for someone who hasn't read the article can you please give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it i think i changed that headline actually to challenges because uh, everything to me is a challenge not a problem it's a slight yes. nuance in that but i prefer a challenge than a problem a problem sort of makes it sound like a bad thing whereas a challenge is something we're just working through um yeah so look i think you know it's about you know keeping the kids motivated and i think a great way to keep kids motivated is to be honest and open and upfront and talk to them about um about you know fears you may have about different challenges about how you can support your kids and how you love your kids and how you know everyone's doing their best and uh you know it's, it's not a time to get down on kids for not completing work they're having challenges sure. as well they haven't seen their friends in two months you know yep. um so it's a, it's a challenging time for all of us but you know their, their their um brains and coping mechanisms aren't necessarily as developed as parents and adults so i think you know keeping kids motivated is important and i think the best way to do that is through love and support not through getting grumpy that something hasn't been completed on time or, yes. uh, or whatever it might be <laughs> yeah um, another one is screens because obviously with getting the information about uh, the education and taking lessons home, you know, they've got to come from somewhere and most likely they have been downloaded from a website or been emailed by the teacher or whatever. So where does the screen start and where does the screen stop? So again, I think it's important to set boundaries and uh, the tricky thing is to, you know, to reinforce those, uh, those boundaries. And if they're let to run to drift, you know, the learning can drift and the kids can drift. But, you know, I think uh, screen time can be a reward or for good behavior, or if there's, you know, poor behavior, uh, you know, screen, screen time can be restricted. And what I like to do is I like to actually ask my kids, what do you think would be a good penalty um, if you don't do this or do do this, um, we're going to screen time. So if, if you weren't to do this, what do you think would be a good pen? And they'll often say things that people, they say, no screen for two hours. I go, and I say to myself, that's probably more than I would have given you. But yeah, okay, <laughs> no screen for two hours if you do this. So get your kids involved. And when they buy in and they're part of the decision-making process, they actually understand it. And if they've said to you, this is what happens if I don't do that, well, they've made the rules, not you. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to get kids engaged in, um, in, uh, in that discipline and boundaries, particularly around screen times. 
Another thing is, I think, you know, what interests your child? Don't try and stick a square peg in a round hole. If your kid is not interested in the subject, forget about it. Oh, seriously, forget about it. Do something else. Try and get to that same understanding, but through a different means or a different measure. If your kid doesn't uh, like what you're trying, you know, I don't. I think the days of trying to force your kid to do it because we think they need to do it is just um, is just not on. They're not interested, and it's uh, it's a lot of hard work, and I think it's um, a bit of a waste of time. <laughs> um, I think you know, parents obviously finding time to teach. You know, you're working, you've got your own commitments, and you're at home trying to do your things. So again, that becomes a bit of a scheduling issue. But also, I mean, I, I've keep excusing myself from online work or stuff I do to go and help my kids out. So I think if you can make a decision that, you know, your kids come first or your kids come first for between nine and three during the day, and then you can focus on, uh, on what you're doing uh, yeah. is important because it, it is very difficult to juggle all the different roles that you might need to be doing from working at home. Uh, and um, I think it's, it's difficult to do everything at once. So allocate some time, excuse yourself from a meeting. There's nothing wrong with stepping out of one of those uh, crazy Zoom chats for five minutes to go and help your kids. I'm sure it won't uh, upset anyone. Or you can always say that my reception is not very good and you turn off the camera <laughs> and they just see your initials on the screen. In the meantime, you can nick off, make a cup of tea and help your kids out with their maths. Look at um, you multitasking. <laughs> that's it, multitasking. Who knew if you weren't there for five minutes? i tell you what, it's been working well for me. Um, and I think uh, just to finish off on Rachel is keeping it fun and having a good time. I don't think I've laughed more in the last uh, eight weeks with my kids than, uh, that, than I have in the whole, you know, lifetime together. You know, we've got out and put our runners on and gone for some big, long, you know, 5K walks around the neighbourhood and... Uh, no, there's no one around and um, we're wandering around checking out the parks and cemeteries and looking at some historical figures and seeing if there's any important people buried in the cemetery near us and uh, it's also a great you know history lesson and looking at uh, you know people who might have all died together or what their cause of death might have been and I think that the cemetery is a great place to have a wander around and um, keep it fun and, uh, and have a look around your neighborhood so that'd just be a, you know a few things to keep in mind but look above all don't stress, your kids will feel it, you won't have a great time and uh, make it uh, something that you can look back on fondly rather than look back on and, uh, and complain about. Great advice. And all, all of that information is um, elaborated in the article, which we'll have a link to in the um, introduction paragraph. But I'd love to know in these last few weeks of homeschooling, how else can parents really keep their kids motivated? Is there anything else that you suggest maybe? they should should well, be doing think, considering so you can uh, you, treat, you can have games and, and rewards or you know you can set um you know different um uh, time limits around things and, and kids really do respond well to to those uh those boundaries so i think you can make um, things into competitions I've got a, a, at home, we've got a system where, you know, I have a dot system where good behaviour gets dots added, poor behaviour gets dots deducted. Ooh, at the deducted. End of, <laughs> at the end of each term, yeah. So um, at the end of each term, we look at all that and there's a, there's a financial payout. So we don't have pocket money, but if you, if you behave well and do your jobs, you get recognised. But if you muck up and don't contribute around the house, you might end up with not as much as your siblings. So I and think, is that uh, something uh, that you've got visually, um, is it yeah, on the fridge or something? Where they can yeah. see all the time exactly it's in the uh, it's on a, a blackboard actually it's a sheet of glass that's right on it with a a, um, a whiteboard marker but yeah it's something in the hallway where they walk past and they can see it so they know what um what might be coming in their way or they might see that they're uh, uh not doing quite as well and need to lift and they can start unpacking the dishwasher or something that's fantastic. Now, you mentioned earlier that it's much easier for, for children to learn if they're interested in the topic. Um, and I guess there's, I guess, two ways of learning, either by repetition or making it fun. And if we had a choice hands down, it would be the second option, of course. So can you tell us how parents can make learning fun whilst at home? Is there anything else that they can be doing at the moment? Yeah, well, I think um, uh, the different elements, you know, we we're talking about uh, screen time before. So there's a lot of, um, most things you can look up and find a five minute uh, YouTube video to show you how or to explain a scenario. And a lot of it is a lot wittier and a lot more insightful and conducted by a person more intelligent than me or the parent or whoever's looking at it. So I would, you know, I would recommend you know, things like um, if you go to your kid who's used to you saying, you know, get off the screen, kid, you've been on there too long. And if you say, hey, why don't we go and look it up on YouTube? Let's find a really cool person explaining the theory of relativity to us in five minutes. So you can go on there and there might be some household experiments. 
the kitchen is a fantastic place for learning. There's so many weights and measures and yeah. timing and all different ingredients coming together. There's design, there's planning, there's, you know, communication. There's so many different skills that are in the kitchen, particularly around preparing meals together. Um, you know, I'd say when all else fails, get your kids in the kitchen and do some cooking together. Um, you know, it's something, it's a life skill. It's, um, it requires a lot of uh, application. Again, communication, design, concentration, maths, weights, measures, all these different things. And, you know, we can uh, do um, a, a lot in the kitchen. There's lots of scientific experiments. In fact, we've got a whole section on the Cool Australia website whereby um, we uh, invite kids to uh, create a whole lot of science experiments just from th things you find in your pantry in your kitchen at home. So, um, yeah, keep it interesting. Keep it in touch with reality and, uh, and make it motivational. And, you know, you'll, the time will fly. You'll have good fun and your, uh, your kids will um, have a whole new view of you. Mm. And you mentioned earlier on about real world learning. Um, so is that, is this what you're talking about or is it any different? So how yeah. can parents incorporate real world learning into sure. their, well, into their days? It's certainly the, the hands-on practical stuff, you know, the, the real things, but also things going on, you know, beyond the, our house, whether it's, um, um, whether we're looking at uh, environmental or social things, you know, a lot of our, our kids, you know, uh, through our teachers tell us, you know, oh, we really want to um, learn about um, uh, racism. We really want to learn about uh, homelessness. How does someone become homelessness? What's, what's the story there? How, what's happening with the plastic in our oceans? So the, um, we would present the kids with a data set around um, uh, uh, plastic and oceans and the kids will do a calculation and, and put up the hand and go oh, miss there's um you know there's more ocean there's more there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than there are fish in the next 20 years and uh for a kid to come up with that determination by looking at the data sets looking at the litter looking at the recycling rates understanding these real world scenarios that are with us now is such a powerful way of uh of education you know we don't teach kids or what to think, but we do teach them how to think. And we really emphasize them considering all the different elements um, into their decision making. And why is, uh, why is ocean pollution a thing? What are the barriers to stopping it? Um, and if they had their way, what would they uh, do to stop it? And you know, the, the kids are very uh, you know, ingenious on this sort of stuff. And they say, well, you know, if something can't be recycled and if it isn't taken to a recycling, <laughs> Well, it can't be sold. Why would we even sell it? Why would we put an object into our um, into our um, uh, uh, waste system that uh, doesn't disintegrate and doesn't uh, become food for other animals like it does in nature? So, you know, kids start questioning these things. They want to know why we're not doing a better job uh, looking after our life support system, so which is our planet. So, you know, it's um, uh, it's a good opportunity for kids to think about uh, the world around them and uh, to understand that uh, you know there's maths and science and um, you know behind pretty much everything that's happening. And let's uh, understand that and, and you know find out why is it so. Mm, and so with Cool Australia, it's been said that you want um, our education system to empower students to to address the big social, economic, environmental cha changes, as you've just mentioned. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think this could be any more pertinent than right now with what we've been going through this particular year with fires, drought, now COVID-19. So um, is there anything else you can expand on this um, uh, point of view and what else we should be doing? Yeah, well, I, again, I think that that practical understanding, you know, when I was a kid at school, I used to put my hand up a lot and say, oh, miss, when's this ever going to do me any good? And say, oh, it's in the textbook. You know, I don't know. We're, you know, shut up, Kimberly, and keep learning. But, you, um, but that you'd, wasn't... you'd be challenging the teachers is what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would ask, when's this ever going to do me any good? I, I can't see why I'm learning this um, uh, material. And uh, that was one of the challenges that we had when we started Cool Australia. I never wanted a kid to put their hand up and say, when's this ever going to do me any good? The answer should be right now. You should be learning about something that is going on in the real world. You should be having some valuable takeaway learnings and information about how the world works um, rather than just learning uh, some theory from a 20-year-old maths textbook. So an example of that would be, you know, um, uh, because we, uh, we might have a year eight maths teacher come to our, our website and go, what's all this got to do with me? And they go, year eight maths, enter and down drops 40 lessons that are all part of the national curriculum that need to be taught to kids. But the kids will learn about their maths, but they might learn their maths by measuring the melt rate of the Greenland ice sheet and implications on sea level rise for the next thousand years. Um, and they will do those sums. And they go, oh, you know, so the, uh, the, sea, the sea's rising, I had no idea. And they've done all these calculations. So they've learnt their maths, but they've also understood 
one of the challenges that's going along around uh, around them in the in the real yeah. world. So that type of learning is um, just so useful. We had a teacher write me write us a letter about a couple of months ago, and he'd had a group of his um, not year nine disengaged math students doing a, an outdoor maths uh, activity. And uh, he said he, all the kids were very happy with the lesson. They were walking back inside. He said a cohort of about 10 boys walked up to him and said, oh, sir, that was the best maths lesson you've ever taught us. And he said he puffed his chest out with pride. He was walking back to the classroom. And in the next breath, they said, it wasn't one of yours, was it? And he said, <laughs> no, it wasn't. And they said, well, where'd you get it? And he said, uh, cool Australia. They said, more of those, please. That was the best maths lesson we've ever done. So the point of that is the kids are still learning their maths. In fact, they're learning more than they otherwise would have because they're outside. They're in a different environment. They're connecting to uh, nature in this instance, or they might be connecting to some data about, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever it might be. So the more you can relate it back to something the kids understand, whether it's about mobile phone technology, we've done a lot of work on, you know, people being distracted with their phones uh, and how they can um, you know be in, be in control of the technology and not let the technology control us and uh, that's one of the things through his, human history is that we often invent, invent technology but we don't know enough about it and it ends up controlling us, us before yes. we can get a good control of it whether it's a massive digger um, or a, a, a huge jumbo jet or you know a mobile phone whatever it is it's um I've had the conversation with one of my kids today I said that device is in control of you. You are not in control of it. And I need to see some changes and you need to prove to me that you're in charge. So we looked at the data on his mobile phone for the last week, his average hours. And I said, this chart, this chart, this graph needs to start coming down. Do you think you can do it? And he said, I'll give it a go. I said, if you're unable to do it by yourself, mum and I are going to have to step in and help you. Fantastic. So is it, is it that you make all decisions on quantitative and qualitative data at all? Um, look, some of it we do, some of it's, you know, sort of organic and, uh, and it evolves. But yeah, a lot of our work we do with our research with our teachers and educators and asking them what they do with our resources after they've downloaded them, how many times, you know, they share it with other teachers, how many times they teach it a year. So there is a mixture of that, but also, you know, focus groups are really important and we obviously get all the raw data from our website as to what's the most popular lessons and, you know, who's um, looking for what. But, you know, I, what, the one thing that is for sure, the, 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 the closer the link between the real world activities that happen around us and our learning, so it's practical, it's useful, it's informative, we're talking about things that we know and we're familiar with, it just makes the whole process of learning and understanding so much more fluid, so much yes. more acceptable, so much more understandable, rather than talking about abstract uh, uh, things in textbooks that really don't uh, excite nor entertain nor energise. So look, you've given us some really insightful stuff today. If you were to summarise, I guess, your key messages for our audience, um, being families with children all around Australia, what would your key messages be? Well, I would say be thoughtful. I would say be patient. I would say be kind. I would say when your students, your kids return to school as students, I think it's important to stop and take measure of what a wonderful job our teachers do. And I think we should have a whole new respect for teachers and the work they do educating our children. Yes. Well, Jason, thank you so much for your time today. We'll have a link through to Call Australia um, and, and also the, um, the article that you've published, um, that we've published for you. Um, and really hope for another opportunity in the not too distant future to have another chat with you. I've really loved it today. So thank you for your time. Good on you, Rachel. Thanks for having me. All right, bye take bye. care. Bye. See ya.